what's supposed to happen in the scene is he realizes the possum's there and goes like, ah, and then the possum runs away. Except this morbidly obese possum is like, dude, there's fucking fruit on your stomach, and I'm a pet possum. <laughs> okay, so... I assume that they must have, like, smeared possum pheromones all over him or something, because that thing clearly wants to fuck the actor. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> oh, the director was like, okay, and cut. And the possum was like, peanut butter, shut up. Still going. <laughs> <laughs> peanut butter. All right. God awful movie. 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 Welcome back to the Gamcast, where each week we sample another selection from Christian cinema because Eli's kid is a mooch. I'm your host, No Illusions, and sitting 700 miles to my immediate left is my good friend Heath Enright. Heath, welcome back. Thanks, Noah. So, you know who's a good poet? I, I do not. Rudyard Kipling. <laughs> oh, God, no. <laughs> <laughs> he's, a, he's a novelist and a journalist, too, but mm -hmm. the movie is yep. more focused on the poetry, actually. Just this one piece of poetry mm -hmm. from Kipling. Boy, ain't it. And, of course, sitting 900 miles to my northeast is my bad friend, Eli Bosnick. Eli, how are you this fine afternoon, sir? H.P. Lovecraft, unappreciated author of science fiction. <laughs> I'll tell you right now. <laughs> woke, woke is a great word to describe H.P. Lovecraft. All right, boy, this is descending quick, cool. right? <laughs> All right, so tell us, Heath, what will we be breaking down today? We watched... Geronimo, <laughs> which is the, the least offensive part of the really, movie, yeah. racially, uh -huh. actually. <laughs> it's the story of the white man's burden. Yep. That's it. Yo. That's the story. They took an extremely racist poem from 1899, and in 1990, they made a Christian movie about it, and it's about kids from a gang in Chicago getting saved at a Jesus camp. Right. Except it's done so badly that even the racist caricatures in their movie are disappointed with the white man's technique. Yeah. And and they just roast him the whole time about how he's carrying out the burden like an idiot. It's it's pretty fun, that accidental angle of it. But otherwise, it's just terrible. And, I mean, spoilers for the rest of this review. Would we say they get saved at Jesus camp? No, that's because, the thing. Um, yeah, right, right. This is the white man just shrugging off that burden, right? Like, or <laughs> or half-assing it to a point where it didn't even matter. Yeah, I prayed for my burden to work. That's good. Yep. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> and Eli, how bad was this movie? Well, if you thought the help was bad, if you were blindsided by the blind side. Then buckle the fuck up because this is some Christian white saviorism, motherfucker. Oh yeah. <laughs> I this is how crazy racist and horrible this movie is. I did not realize the problematic nature of the title of this movie until Heath announced it just now. I was wow. so That's focused right. on the constant actually, racism. It's the new name of the Washington football yeah. team. <laughs> <laughs> They're in a committee. We yeah, don't know. So we we'll don't find know. out. We'll find Spoilers. out. Spoilers. All right. So is there anything you guys want to nominate this one for being the best at being the worst at? Yeah. I'm going to say best worst inventing new stereotypes. Uh -huh. Okay. So the entire movie, we're following around five kids from a gang in Chicago and they're going over the top. The movie's going over the top with all the racial stereotypes of that. But the movie clearly felt like they, I don't know, ran out. As, as if that's like a risk you, you have to worry about. So they just made up new ones partway through the movie. They were in the writer's room and somebody was like, all right, let's brainstorm. Uh, the free association, just shout out the first thing that comes to mind when I say black people. And it was like, gasoline, whittling nunchucks, afraid of thunder. All right. <laughs> okay. Oh, well, it's gasoline. Got it. Whittling nunchucks. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And afraid of thunder. Well, all right, I'm writing it down. Yeah, I don't know if it's a positive thing to say, but there is some out-of-the-box racism in this movie. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right, so, of course, I'm going to do, do the easy one here. I'm going to go best, worst use of David A.R. White. All right. Oh. <laughs> so the main reason we're watching this is because this is the first film credited on David A.R. White's IMDb filmography, right? Yes. But, of course, he was nobody then. Nobody knew he was going to become... 
the Christian movie titan that he is now. So he's got he's he's not an under five, but he's an under seven, right? <laughs> right? So he's credited as overbearing counselor. He's right between angry mom and woman whose car is stolen. Build way below gang member at payphone one and gang member at payphone two. But it's a start. It's a start. Wow. Aim high. He's he's gone a long way. Right now he's starring in the Pure Flix original series. Love during the quarantine. <laughs> oh, I thought you were going to. I thought you were going to say he was starring in the Pure Flix original series. Please buy a lifetime membership. <laughs> membership. <laughs> yeah, He's no, you don't understand. <laughs> it's like that's you know how whole life Netflix. insurance is a great investment. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a reverse mortgage, but for streaming. <laughs> <laughs> And see, I was going to go with best worst racist closed caption. Yes. <laughs> if you watch this movie, I swear this is true. If you watch this movie, almost every time African American characters in this movie speak, the captioning is <laughs> inaudible. Yes. Because the white person who did the CC for this movie, who has like, Three different types of horse nays that they differentiate between. <laughs> <laughs> every time he talks blackingly, just every That's so every bad. time. Nineteen ninety. The closed captioning mumbles. It's like <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right, right, yeah, exactly. The the closed captioning just rubs its arm a little subtly. Yeah, yeah. Closed <laughs> captioning tried to sing along with the n word in a little. <laughs> 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 Mm. Oh, Close right. captioning thinks all lives matter. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> all right. Well, I'll tell you what. There's a lot of inaudible to get to, so we're going to keep the break brief. And when we come back, we'll dive into all the sequential scenes that are Geronimo. Hi, Karen. Um, can I talk to you for a second? Oh, the producer of the movie. Come on in. Did you, did you see my new poster? Huh? Oh, oh, hang in there. Yeah, I get it. Cause. Yeah, no, you don't get it because the cat is hanging on the branch. No, I, yeah, no, I understand. Yeah. So look, I, I wanted really? to talk to you about the closed captioning that you did for the movie. Oh, I know. I know. No need to thank me. You are welcome. Well, I wasn't gonna. Yes. Yeah, so, so, um, I, I'm wondering, did you want the script? Cause we have that, right? So, so you could like maybe fill in some of the parts that are a little harder to hear. Mm, nope. Nope. I don't need that. I know what I'm doing. Oh, okay, so okay, so like in scene three, when Joe is talking, the closed captioning that you put in is just says, "quote inaudible blackness." Mm-hmm. Yeah. Or like, or two scenes later, when Reggie's praying, you wrote, "I assume some kind of rap music. I don't like rap music. My niece went to see Hamilton last July, and she said it was good, but it seems like it wouldn't make any sense because none of those people were black." None of those people were black, exactly. Yeah, these are the close. Okay, so, and then uh, just one other one. During the big waterfall scene, uh, whenever Leroy talked, you would just write, I'm calling the police? I did, every time. You know, uh, th this will be fun, I guess. Ah, I knew it. Gold stars for Karen. Oh, also, one last thing. It's about your comments in the suggestion box. Oh, Yeah. We don't have a suggestion box, uh, and we would appreciate it if you stopped bringing one from home. No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and we're back for the breakdown, and we're going to open up on a quote from Matthew about some man's burden or another. I believe Heath already mentioned it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this quote, Matthew 913, is basically saying... All right, we're talking to the heathens of color here, not the good yes. white Christian people. <laughs> right. In this yeah. movie, Matthew 9.13. And then we get uh, porn music over a bunch of pictures of a brother and sister, which is uncomfortable. Yeah. Oh, this was fun. Like this, I was, I was like, wow, this is okay. Pornographic eighties sitcom is starting right now. I'm <laughs> on board with this. Boy, does that nail the theme. It was like, who's the boss? But like, you know, Tony was in porn. So, great. <laughs> I wrote down music cue. Bill Clinton is going to make love to you, baby. Love. <laughs> <laughs> so then the narrator cuts in and he's like, I'm the narrator. Uh, my dead sister sure will be central 
to my motivations, Drunk Driver. <laughs> it's it's a Christian movie, so it's either going to be that or Cancer. It was Drunk Driver in this instance. Yeah, this might be our fastest atheist because of tragedy in a movie we've ever seen. <laughs> it's rare that they introduce it that way. Yeah. Just uh-huh. cold open. I'm an atheist now, problem of evil. Okay. <laughs> Yep. All right. Looks like starting a movie. Wow. <laughs> Two seconds. All right. Not bad. Starting the, have you guys heard about the Cokeville bomb that just happened? God, it's fucking weird. <laughs> so then, okay, so then there's, we, we get introduced to the terrible miking in this film and in such a great way because he's like, you know, I really haven't had much of a relationship with God since my sister died. And then I guess the mom shows up, knocks on his door and yells something through the door. But it's Mike so bad that I couldn't tell. Right. So he's like, I haven't had much of a relationship with God. And then he just turns to no one apropos of nothing and says, yeah, I don't feel like going. <laughs> yeah. <he's> just <laughs> What was that? Did you say want, 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 want? No, I don't feel like going. <laughs> so, but it was not the almighty he was speaking to. It was either his mother or the ghost of his mother based on the appearance of this woman. <laughs> I, I swear there is nothing that you guys can say that'll convince me this actress didn't die five days before they filmed and just get reanimated using a fucking haunted locket and, and, and uh, hubris or something. <laughs> I feel like this was a weird case of like the makeup artist getting in an argument with someone being like, I could too do a, a Victorian piece about the plague. I'll show you right now. I'll do it on the mom. <laughs> Everyone will just okay. no, You were right. You're right. You're good. No, you what it, what's she look like? Late Doug Henning. Exactly. You're welcome. <laughs> the magician? Yeah. But mom shows up <laughs> in his room and, and, and she's like, hey, look, it's been like a month and a half since your sister died. Can you get over the atheism shit? And he's like, no, it's act one. We just barely are even started with the fucking. What are you? Are you kidding me? <laughs> but I do believe we have a plot. I would not like to go to church. Great. <laughs> <laughs> Right, so he goes down for uh, for breakfast, and Dad gives him shit for not going to church as well. Yeah, he says, uh, he says, go to church or you can't have any more food. And I was like, the good guys of the movie, everyone. The good guys yep. of the movie. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but just then, a gaggle of girls shows up to just drag him to church by his dick, and that works. Yes. Oh, man, the patterns <laughs> these young women are wearing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, they're so loud they blew out the speakers on my TV. <laughs> the Huxtables walked by the house and were like, uh, gauche, gauche. Open. Also, a reason your speakers might have blown out is all of them talking at once, screaming <laughs> like oh. crazy people. Clearly, the script was like, all right, we don't have to write this whole thing out. Everybody just, you know, improvise a quick hello and then go into the, the script part. And that was a terrible fucking idea because it's just like, hello, hi, hi, hello. We are Come on, talking hi. all of us now. Hello, hello, hello. Like a minute of that. And then they cut off at the exact same second. Right? Yeah, yeah. Drug cartel kidnappers watch that scene and they're like, oh, okay, take it easy, man. This is a lot. <laughs> Very, it's a lot. Well, and by the way, the filmmaker will not learn their lesson about that in this scene because we will do that 16,000 more times in the film. Some of the inaudible wasn't racism. (laughs) (laughs) Not when it was five white people. It's going to switch real fast. Yeah. All right. So now they're they're driving to church in front of the shittiest green screening in oh, all the of fl- movie. History. There's a flap coming off of it in the yeah. corner. Steve, the tech, walks behind them at one point. It's supposed they're in a convertible, but don't worry, nobody's hair seems to have noticed. Okay, now Noah, it was the 1980s. Hair was immovable from 1979 until 1991. That's a fact. <laughs> Yep. That's All science. Right. So some of that. And uh, the suburbs of Chicago had the same cactus a lot. Back in <laughs> that was weird. Oh, Jesus. And so, like, he's talking to love interest girl. This is Trisha. And he, by the way, is Jeremy. I don't know if we've uh, mentioned that either way. So Jeremy's talking to Trisha, and uh, she's like, so what have you been reading recently? And he's like, German philosophy. <laughs> <laughs> read about the death of God mostly. Mostly Nietzsche. Yeah, you know. right. <laughs> Do you hear God actually died? Yeah, died. <laughs> and she's like, fuck you, man. In the Bible, Jew is what I meant in the Bible. <laughs> and then he's like, oh, then, uh, then no. no <laughs> so, not. At which point she opens up her scrapbook and she's like, I brought a. 
newspaper clipping of your dead sister. You want to you wanna read it? Speaking of reading, <laughs> yeah. Did you read anything in the newspaper? Any good <laughs> obituary? <laughs> or, oh, right. Sorry. All right, so now we're at uh, youth group. They finally get to youth group, and they're getting the big pitch for Camp Zion, the Christian summer camp that they should all volunteer for, right? I fucking <laughs> love this timeshare pitch for Jesus. Yeah. I want everyone to get like half a steak dinner at the end of Yeah, that. right, right, exactly, exactly. Can we get the coupons for the zoo now just so we know we have them? So we know. All right, and of course, during the slideshow that they're showing of this camp, they have the picture of Jeremy and his dead sister, right? <laughs> and there's this awkward, oh, uh, so everybody, I'm moving on to the next slide. Look at all of these alive people on this one. <laughs> The exact words are, oh, there's Christine. Man, do we miss her. Absolutely no pause. Also, we had a pie fight. You all remember the pie fight? (laughs) Which means that as this guy was putting his slides together, he was like, oh, the Christine photo is going to be a downer. You know what? Pie fight brings the mood right back up. Get the product in their hands. (laughs) All right, so now that we've established all that, we've got to go check in on the inner city. We have this insane series of establishing oh. shots for the projects. Oh, it's got the inner city Chicago. It's got cowboys. It's got what? open fruit <laughs> trucks. <Okay. laughs> Those were cow. I'm not crazy. There, there were, were cowboys, cowboys yeah. in downtown Chicago. Yeah, apparently. Yeah, we'll ask okay. Cecil about them. But yeah, the whole thing is like, this is where the people of color live. In Urbanville, and you know the electric boogaloo is happening on every sidewalk. <laughs> yep, Everything yeah. is choreographed in their head. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, I want to talk about the two guys who get in a fight. So they they asked these two actors to improvise a little fight starting as one walks out of the building. So their conversation goes, "Hey man, where are you going?" I'm going somewhere. You ain't got nowhere to be. And they just start shoving each yeah. other. I wanted so badly for them to just be like, wait, I'm sorry. Did I say you ain't got nowhere to be? And then we're fighting over it? This is stra- I'm sorry. This is on me. I'm having a terrible day. Very, I was very I aggressive. You, you do have somewhere not- to be. That's crazy. <laughs> okay. Whether you left or not, you would still be somewhere, I guess. This is also where the narrator's like, we had all the gangs, the Latin Kings, the Pony Tonies, the totally real gang that someone did not just make up to mess with me. (laughs) Yeah, the narrator cuts in and he's like, 18 miles away from my house is where we kept all the non-whites through a red line district. Anyway, so and then he describes inner city Chicago. He goes, to me, the city just meant Cubs games, dirty politics and snipers. And I'm like, wow, that fucking city hasn't changed a lick in 30 years. Sorry, what was the last one? What was the last thing you said? Yeah, you snipers. Say snipers? Yeah, people yeah. getting shot at Chicago, yeah. Yeah, this is he actually says Cabrini Green snipers. So this is actually a, a reference to something mm, kind of real. There was like housing projects that had one incident that I'm aware of where like gang members had sniper rifles and somebody got shot, but this is them being like Yep, the gun problem in America. That's it. It's the Cabrini <laughs> Green projects. Yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. All right. So, and then, of course, the narrator's like, you know, but I'm afraid of black and Hispanic people and the way that they'll kill you for wearing the wrong colors. I'm white. <laughs> and then we meet the posse, right? So, this is the five, I guess, homeless kids, semi homeless kids or whatever that are going to be at the center of this movie. Yep. Oh, and they're just walking down the street, giving strangers tummy raspberries and tussling their hair. <laughs> <laughs> and they will never not walk in rhythm to yep. 80s hip hop doing the electric boogaloo. Like their whole life is bringing the noise, bringing the funk, like as people <laughs> all the time. Yeah. Yeah. So they sneak into a fancy hotel to go swimming. And this is so that we can introduce that one of these kids, Ralph, has a complex backstory that has him afraid to go into the water. We will (laughs) tease that out a little bit at a time for the next hour and a half of this film for you. Yeah. And by the way, they'll do it with all the delicacy of like, hey, man, I know you're afraid to go in the water and that's your backstory. And he's like, that is my backstory. (laughs) Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. So they but they get kicked out of the hotel. And they're like, I don't know. What do you guys want to do? What is there to do in the city? 
on a Friday night, and they're like, oh, you guys want to go watch the drive-bys? Yeah, let's go watch the drive-bys. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> uh, like, I'm not saying I'm against it, but you're aware of a drive-by that's going to happen? <laughs> it's it's Is there scheduled. A grapevine for that? Who? What? There's a website you can log in. And they're like, whatever, we're going. Yeah. Right, so they, they they head out to where they happen to know that a drive by is going to happen, so that they can watch all the cool dying. <laughs> and hey, let's be clear: this dying is excellent. <laughs> it's phenomenal. This is some of the best movie dying we've ever seen. It's like they shot the first Domino when they drive by. All oh. these like eight guys, the squibs all go off at once, and eight guys all fall in unison. They fucking oh. swoon like it's Beatlemania. It's amazing. <laughs> yeah. This is some of the best dying we've seen. And we watched Samurai Cop for two months ago's bonus episode. <laughs> oh, wow. That was amazing. And, and then we get the, the carjacking, right? Where they <laughs> carjack the lady. And the lady yeah. says, and I quote, hey, my car. Oh, man. <laughs> yeah. This movie is what your grandma thinks the Black Lives Matter protests were. Your grandma, this is your, yep. Your grandma saw this movie on UPN and she thought this was the protests. <laughs> this entire sequence so far was just that grandma being like, all right, I'm going to introduce black people in the movie. Yep. Yes. Let's go. Uh, we've got Electric Boogaloo. We've got knowing about drive-by shootings that they attend for fun. Breaking into a fancy hotel and scaring the white people. Uh, carjacking. Yes. All right. Got it. Yep. Let's carjack a white woman who's vulnerable. There's one. Perfect. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So they carjack this lady to get away from the drive-by. They drive a little way, uh, but the cops jump in right behind him. And I'm like, okay, if the cops don't shoot him, uh, the drive-by is only the second least realistic part of the movie, and it is. Right? <laughs> I wrote yeah. the same thing. I said, this movie's about the divinity of Christ, and the least realistic part is these kids survive this police encounter. Yes, right. <laughs> Although, I will say, there is, like, one white, or at least looks white. Oh, yeah, yeah, member. and he gets out first. You're right. He saved the other four. <laughs> <laughs> it would have been funny if he got out and he was like, what's the problem, officer? Everyone else gets out. They instantly get shot. Oh, oh, God. Uh, sorry. I felt threatened. Were those kids stealing your car, sir? <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> you want to buy some fireworks? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So now we come to the police department where the cops are going to scare these kids straight. Via nostalgia. Right. He, he opens the scene by being like, ah, I remember when you adorable little scamps were breaking into the big little league games. But now you're murderers and car thieves. <laughs> they grow up so quick. these days. He said they were breaking into Wrigley Field. And I yes. love that. Eli, I think that's a little league field. Right, go well, ahead. Yeah. So, yeah. But he says, hey, either you tell me who the shooter is and I just sentence you to Christianity or you don't tell me who did the drive by and you have to go to prison. And and like me personally, I don't that's a tough decision <laughs> well, right there, right? Well, what's great is the kids in the scene are like, like the cops like, do you guys want to snitch or and they're like, snitch, we would like to snitch, please. please <laughs> snitch. <laughs> snitch. And the cops like, all right, well, it looks like we have ourselves a what? <laughs> <laughs> So, okay. And meanwhile, the narrator is heading to the very same camp on his motorcycle. He's decided he's going to volunteer for this camp because he thinks it's a good way to get into Trisha's panties, right? Oh, and this this is where this movie first hints at the fact that it's actually just going to be all of my thoughts projected onto the screen through these African-American characters' mouths because he's <laughs> driving his motorcycle with the narration going on over him when the bus full of black characters pulls up and roasts him for yes! a solid three minutes for the rest of this driving sequence. <laughs> yes! He's in the middle of it. He's like, guys, I'm doing a narration. Could you, could we, oh, oh. Just me and myself on the, oh, fuck your face. <laughs> <laughs> And by the way, like, so for quite a while in this movie, every time these kids are on screen, they will all talk at the same time. Yep. Like every moment with them is the last four seconds of an it's always sunny scene. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, OK, so we but we all get to Camp Zion and we have to meet Grady, the bad guy head counselor. What? 
was cut from this film that this character exists. I want to know what we were supposed to piece together. This character will be in three scenes for four seconds each, one of which he will be jerking off during. I have no idea what he was supposed to add to the plot. Well, and then by the time by by the time it's over, he's he's walking up to us going like, "Well, I sure have had a character arc." And we're like, "No. <laughs> you really haven't, sir." But yeah, so this is Grady. He walks up to Jeremy as he arrives at camp on his motorcycle. He's like, hey, uh, no motorcycles allowed on the camp. And also try to look less dorky. Your clothes are dorky. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that uh, peach colored PK polo shirt is way too racy. So. <laughs> I feel like Have a fucking respect. crazy person. Am I wrong or were they dressed identically as white guys in the 80s? I could yep. not tell yeah. them apart. <laughs> right, exactly. I'm sorry, friend. Are those chinos unpleated? All right, relax, Chippendales. You want to get your change out of them? <laughs> All right, so now we cut over to the the gang kids. They are, like, settling in, and I don't know what this character is supposed to be, right? Because he's not a camper. (laughs) He's not a counselor. It will be revealed he is not a camper, which brings up lots of troubling questions about his existence in this movie. Oh, do you mean this amazing character bit actor? Yes, yeah. yeah, uh yeah. Fishing hat, yeah. Fishing hat? Yeah, so he walks up and he's like, hey, we don't see a lot of African-Americans in our camp. I'd like to introduce myself. I'm going to be comic relief, or at least that's the idea here anyway. If there's anything I can get for you. And, of course, one of the kids immediately goes, "Uh, how about some cocaine? (laughs) (laughs) And he's like, um, I know a high rock you can jump off of. (laughs) I don't like that the first suggestion that the white kid had for the only African Americans at the camp was how about jumping off something high yeah. up? <laughs> yeah, it's not great. He also he tries to like do the Dale Carnegie make friends and influence people thing. He's like, well, there, T Bone, I like your tattoo. And again, because these characters are the representation of my id, he's like, I like your tattoo. And they're like, fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so now we get Jeremy going over and, and like, finding out that his assignment is going to be to take care of these kids, right? And I have to point out this one sequence as they're moving into the, uh, I guess, the stables or whatever where he's going to get his assignment. There's this shot where it looks like one of the characters is stepping out of the anus of one of the horses. Was this just... (laughs) Like, I honestly, like, I know that the guy did not, like, the horse didn't give birth to him as this scene became, but I only know that because he isn't wet. It's It's, so, (laughs) it's, I think it is the actor trying to like, oh, am I out of the shot? Let me step into the shot here. But it absolutely looks like he is pantomiming, like, (laughs) Ace Ventura 2, Call of the Wild. I did it. So, yeah, so, of course, they explained to him that he can't have the cush assignment that he wanted. He has to be the counselor for the black kids. Yeah. To which his immediate response is, God, those guys are wild animals. Yep. Those are the exact words. Dial it back, Chad. God damn. (laughs) Also, he has this moment when the guy gives him the assignment where he's like, hey, don't they need like therapy or a social worker and the boss guy is just like Jesus yes <laughs> yes he literally says he goes these kids need a psychiatrist and he goes you can be their psychiatrist and I wanted him to be like no no I can't <laughs> I literally can't you know that's a real job right <laughs> yeah it's, it requires all kind of education and whatnot but no so he he decides he's gonna do it so he goes out and all the kids introduce themselves by their gang names so that we get all the bingo squares e- nice and early, right? Yep. This is also where we get the butterfly knife. <laughs> all right. Well, so one of the side plots of this movie is that one of these kids can like materialize knives from his fucking ears or something. Insane knives. <laughs> Insane. The the largest, most dangerous way. I expected at any point that like they'd be roasting marshmallows. It pans over to him. He's got a bazooka on the end of his stick. What? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's like a video game character. He's playing yes, like Call right, of Duty. He's right, just like yes. pulling out weapon after weapon after weapon somehow. <laughs> and the counselor guy's like, yeah, I, I don't know where they keep it. Like, we stop and frisk them every day. Where do you guys get those? All right, is that a butterfly <laughs> knife? Give it back. Give it back. <laughs> And and when they do the names thing here, 
the kids all introduce themselves by their their gang names, mm-hmm. but their gang names all sound like they <laughs> failed their audition for the Chippendales. <laughs> <laughs> Like a really sad version of American Gladiators or something. That. <laughs> yeah, it it was lightning. Okay, lightning. Sure. Tinkle. I'm Ooh. pretty sure Tinkle was mm. the gang name of one of them. Mm. Midnight, S and M. And I was like, okay, like a sexual thing. And th- the counselor asked, he's like, oh, what's S and M? And that stands for Saturday Night Special. Yeah, Saturday I don't think S&M. I'm Meshel. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Also, magic. Is the yeah, last one magic? Yeah. <laughs> and then, of course, Trisha, the the love interest, happens by right then. So she stops, and and he's like, "Hey, do you want to like to get together and do something?" She's like, "This is literally my job that I'm doing right now. We're coworkers, and I'm working." And he's like, "Right." So yes. I have a pet theory about this Trisha plot, which is that Trisha will spend the rest of the movie, in my opinion pretending not to understand that he is hitting on her yes. to get out of hanging out with Jeremy because he's like, hey, we should hang out. And she's like, hang out a window. That sounds dangerous. Bye. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. She's a, a woman from all the decades ever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So she rides off and then they go check out their cabin. The the homeless kids are very unimpressed with the cabin. I'm like, you guys are, are homeless kids. So it seems... Pretty sweet. <laughs> okay. Does does one of them at this point drive his axe that he pulls out of nowhere into a pillar and just <laughs> store it there? Yep. A battle yep. axe? Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah, he's got a little tiny axe. It like, it, it's kind of like the rock hammer that Andy Dufresne had, but a little bigger. Yeah, and also, th- <laughs> so they have to show, boy, these kids sure are incorrigible. So they show him immediately setting the cabin that they're in on fire. Seconds later. Seconds later, it was like, this cabin sucks. I'm putting my axe here. And counselor turns around for a second, and there's a giant fight. They're just like <laughs> a thing of gasoline. They've smuggled in a container of gasoline, too, along with the axe. And there's a big fire going because that's what they do. Yeah. And as he puts it out, they're like, oh, come on, man. I was lighting that on fire. <laughs> yeah, right, right. And then he <laughs> turns back around and one of the kids suddenly has a goddamn switchblade. And he's like, oh, guys, where did that switchblade come from now? Oh, you guys keep doing that. All right. <laughs> Go just. OK, give me back the knife. Go have fun at camp now. Hop, hop. No chainsaws. Pass them in. <laughs> How do you do that? <laughs> it was like a naked gun montage, just constantly ever more firearms falling out of oh. these children <laughs> onto the floor. Is that a nuclear satellite? I don't even understand. <laughs> That's not even a thing. What? Also, and I love this moment so much. We reveal the uh, Jeremy's dark secret. We see that he's brought alcohol onto the camp mm. in the form of one wine cooler. <laughs> Singular. Yep. Wine cooled. He's got a Bartle and James. Yeah. <laughs> Singular Bartles and James. Very exciting. Gonna throw that in the bug juice. <laughs> so, all right. And, and of course, the, okay, so we, sh- we cut to this scene. Like later on, Trisha is just about to demonstrate some CPR on Jeremy. But before the good stuff can start, Grady, the, um, you know, mean counselor guy has to come up to him and tell him that his kids are fucking up the swim test. Quick question. This isn't necessarily a Christian movie thing. I just want to compare notes on our lives together. Way too many erotic movie scenes from my childhood were based around CPR. Am I wrong about this? I feel like. Oh, yeah. The Sandlot. CPR Mm. as a way to have sex with someone is like the plot of 44 movies. I watched as a child. (laughs) All right, but of course, this whole scene exists so that he can come up and and say, hey, guys, do do you want to go swimming? And one of the kids can go, no, my complex backstory forbids it. And he can go, oh, all right, well, we'll flesh that out in Act 3, I'm sure. Yeah. All right, so now we cut to the scene where they're all having dinner. But they can't say grace correctly because this movie is just a lever being pushed back and forth between Christian movie trope, racism, racism, Christian movie trope. (laughs) Can we get a second lever and just do both? Okay, yeah, we'll just do that. Great. <laughs> yeah, the the prayer ends, the saying grace ends, and one of the kids turns to Jeremy, and he's like, hey, man, why didn't you say amen? He's like, complicated backstory. And they're like, oh, okay, you too, mm. huh? All right. 
And then, so one of Jeremy's major traits in this movie will be to every time somebody makes fun of him, to give them better ammunition, right? Like, oh, come on, man, you can do better than that. <laughs> so one of them's like, man, your mom is so fat, blah, blah, blah. And he's like, my mother's not fat. Here's a picture of her. <laughs> so like, now you can really dig in. <laughs> Jerk off to that right now. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Egg you on can your face. or can't. I'm not sure if I win or lose, but there you go. <laughs> I thought that was a picture of his dead sister, but I guess it was both of them. Yeah, it was yeah, a family both pic. Them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, because they're so, like, hey, who's this hot sister of yours? Yeah. So somebody said, your mom's fat. He pulls out a picture of his mom and dead sister and hands it to them. Okay. That's yeah. what happened there? Trump yeah. card. <laughs> and they're like, wow, this, Okay. We're all very confused. Like, I guess you won this one. I guess you won this one. <laughs> yeah, we are too shocked to continue to make fun of you. Well played. Uh, I don't know what to say next. Do you have any other family members we could make fun of that you would give us a photo of? <laughs> George Washington was fat. Give me a dollar. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, nothing like a nice, somber, dead sister moment to pause for a break. But we'll be back in a minute with even more Geronimo. All right, that will be twenty nine ninety nine. Thank you. Okay, my turn. My turn. Okay, no, just hold on. Let me savor it. Let me savor it. I just made a purchase. I'm uh, saving. All right, which one of you tore the labels off of all the can't? What are you guys doing? Oh, hey Noah. So uh, yeah, Eli and I were playing store because uh, you know we miss buying things. I just got a sweet new shave kit. Well, oh, I wanted to buy a sweet new shave no kit. No copies. No copies. Guys, I already did. Guys. If you want the experience of getting awesome brand new stuff, why don't you just try the box of awesome from Bespoke Post? Wait, what's the box of awesome from Bespoke Post? Bespoke Post sends guys only the best stuff every month. And no matter what you're into, Box of Awesome has you covered. From style and grooming goods to barware, cooking tools and outdoor gear, Box of Awesome has carefully built collections for every part of your life. Mm, yeah, what kind of stuff do they have? Uh, great stuff, like the concentrate box that comes with an iced coffee maker and an awesome desk set. Ooh. That's right. Each box costs only $45, but has over $70 worth of gear inside. Get 20% off your first monthly box when you sign up at boxofawesome.com and enter the code AWFUL at checkout. That's boxofawesome.com, code AWFUL for 20% off your first box. Nice. We are totally in. Great. Uh, now, the canned goods? Seriously? It's for chili surprise. We have canned fruit in there, guys. Yeah, that's why it's a surprise. <laughs> All right, you kids, listen up. Now, I know you you saw who whacked Louis the Goose, and if you don't speak up, it's the slammer for all of you. I'm talking hard time, maximum security. Whatever, man, we ain't talking. Yeah. All right, well, that's up to you. You want to go to the Hooskow for 25 to life? I'm not going to stop you, but uh, you can give me a name. I might see to it that y'all just go to uh, to a Christian summer camp instead. Wait, sorry, what? You heard me. Okay, okay, wait, 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 wait. So our two options are going to a maximum security prison for adults, which we aren't, or going to a Christian summer camp? Christian summer camp, yeah. Like... Like with kayaking and marshmallows and stuff? Yep, that, that's right. Yep. It was, it was Charlie. Charlie. Yeah, Charlie did it. Yeah, excellent. Excellent. This is how being a cop works. I, I guess so. <laughs> and we're back for more of this shit. We're going to open up with the horse riding practice scene. <laughs> 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 this, is, this is one of my favorite moments in several ways. Yeah. He tells them it's just like driving a car, you know. What? But one that has a will of its own and shits. <laughs> In what possible way other than you end up elsewhere at the end? <laughs> is it like driving a fucking car? Right. <laughs> that's cool. We, we almost got murdered by a cop the last time we drove a car. Yeah. So <laughs> that sounds fucking right. great. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> they get on the horse. A cop immediately rolls up with the sirens. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Yeah, you see what we're talking about? Yeah, so. Where do you even come from? That's crazy. <laughs> now we have to go to a Christian camp inside this Christian camp? <laughs> <laughs> but Jeremy's on the horse showing him how easy it is, and one of the kids finds a little nail sticking out of the fence and stabs the horse in the ass with it, right? 
So the horse goes taken off and Jeremy wipes out. And I'm like, you know, honestly, like if he was paralyzed for the rest of his <laughs> life by this or something. <laughs> Sorry, I'm laughing, but. Yeah, he, he falls so hard. Like, so oh yeah, hard. to the point well, where you're. I had to pause here. I laughed so much. I was you know, worried about die. the goddamn stuntman, who, by the way, was three times the size of the actor playing mm-hmm. Jeremy. <laughs> yeah, but he walks over like Wiley e. Coyote, made out of ash. He's <laughs> like, "Oh, you rascals!" <laughs> <laughs> Still halfway in that, like, Oop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Oh, Jesus. And then and then we cut to the crafting scene where, of course, the kids are just making shanks and nunchucks and shit. And ninja stars. It's amazing. Yes. So, whatever we make out of the yarn we gave you, and then pan over to the gang, and they've got swords and bombs. <laughs> and it's, it's crazy. Nunchucks? <laughs> he says, you guys want to make something that doesn't kill people? And they're like, no. And he's like, all right, okay, ask an answer. <laughs> So, yeah, so they get bored making all their ninja weapons, so they decide to go through Jeremy's shit, right? They go back to the cabin, and they go through his bag and steal all of his stuff. (laughs) And this is where David A.R. White happens by to tell him that radios are not allowed at fucking camp. And that line delivery, it's so obvious he's going places. So obvious. <laughs> you, you, yeah, no, he, as as he's as the kids are running off, you believe that radios aren't allowed at camp. Yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> also, while they're stealing all of Jeremy's stuff here, we get uh, theft music <laughs> as the music. And I was like, okay, that's, that's weird to, to choose theft music. But then I was like, oh, that's not the soundtrack. They're actually playing theft music on a boombox. Yeah. Like, that's actually music in the universe of the movie. Yeah, no, they, they tuned it to theft music radio, yeah. And then, so as they're doing this, Jeremy's checking out this Noah's Ark-themed puppet show, and I just, I point that out because, like, I feel like Christians should not lean into the all the babies and puppies died story with their kids as much as they do, but they are unashamed of this one. They love it. It's one of their favorites. To be fair, it's also one of the only stories in their book of stories. That's true. <laughs> yeah. to work. No, you're right. You're right. It's that or cutting up the concubine. <laughs> <laughs> Get so, a stretch arm. Which, if you think about it, actually is a better. Yeah, right. Right. A better story. Far fewer people die in that one anyway. So, OK. Yeah. And then there's this little girl doing the puppet show and she's like, Jeremy, would you like to participate in the puppet show? And he's like, no, I'm selectively brooding. And then she's like, well, then why the fuck are you just in? You want to know how this story goes? Then <laughs> an idiot. I was just hanging out. Just want to see how this happened. I read the book, but I didn't see the movie yet. I wanted to see if it was different in the puppet show. <laughs> so, yeah, so he goes, he's like, you know what I need is some fucking Bartles and James. So he goes back to the cabin and this is where he discovers that the kids have stolen all his shit. So then we cut to the kids. They're at the camp store trying to buy rolling papers and cigarettes. <laughs> yeah. Because all they can think of is this is a bodega, right? So yes. city <laughs> urban bodega stuff. That's it. I want a bag and egg and cheese. And I want I want old, very, very expired Oreos that are a different price for white people than yeah. they are for us. <laughs> I'd like a half a pint of laundry detergent for $14, please. <laughs> and then we, we cut to canoe practice so that everybody can fall out of the canoe yep. for a while. Then they, they go over to, like, watch skit night? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Is that what we're seeing? Because I was very confused. I was confused. It was killing. Whatever it was, was slaying this audience i guess maybe improv i don't know yeah right no it was there, there was like apparently there are like these nightly plays that they put on at the camp or something we don't really establish that very well but we, a couple of times we move away from them this is the first and this ends with jeremy going up to trisha and saying hey do you want to like do you want to sneak off with me and she goes off what, does, what do you mean by off oh again it's so amazing she's just 
playing so dumb to get out of seeing him in any way, shape, or form. He's like, you know, on a date. And she's like, a date on a calendar? And he's like, I don't... <laughs> no. What? You, um, me. <laughs> we go to, like, eat together. Eat? Yeah, like a meal of food <laughs> together. Like we would you be know each food? other's food? You know, know. Like, eating? <laughs> food, nonsense, noise. You're hilarious. Okay, bye. <laughs> All right, yeah, but so he strikes out, and as he's striking out, Grady, the bad guy counselor, comes up to him and says, hey, I need you to get serious about, like, you know, Christianizing those those kids, or there's really no plot at all. Yeah. Hey, how would you say it's going with those uh, inner city kids of color? Oh, they hate me, and they keep making weapons slash having weapons. Mm. Cool. Change their religions. That'll probably, yeah. it seems like a good time. Okay. They're back at the minstrel show that's crushing it right now. Should I go grab them and do that? Yeah. yeah, probably go grab them and do that. That's great. They're about to do the soft shoe. So so he goes back to the cabin, and they the kids have booby-trapped the cabin with this insanely sophisticated water bucket trap. Oh, for sure, yeah. <laughs> they pour water on him, and then they're smoking in his face. He's just getting destroyed by this group of kids. Yeah. <laughs> He's like, all right. All right, we're all having fun. Really elaborate urine bucket traps and <laughs> cigarette blowing in my face. All right, who wants to get saved? Yeah. <laughs> well, right, and so the thing about it is that he never has the sense, this character never has the sense to go, ha you guys got me. All right, moving on, right? Every single time they do something, he freaks the fuck out. And makes it worse, right? And oh, yeah. he's like, oh, yeah? Well, what if I drink all the pee that you dropped on me? <laughs> Joke's on you. <laughs> I love to drink pee. So <laughs> now you have nothing to make fun of. <laughs> don't, don't, don't. I win. I win. I'm winning. The pee chugging winning. contest. Go. <laughs> Spoiler alert. I'm going to throw up. <laughs> but he screams at them like Gary Busey here, which was delightful. Oh, oh the okay. white guy freak out. All yeah. right. So he starts because because he's got to teach him about religion he's got to do the nightly devotionals or whatever so he starts teaching them about christianity and then they start roasting jesus which is amazing and oh, that's so when he good. gives them the all caps ones instead of exclamation mark scream oh <laughs> this is just a couple hundred thousand retweets away from him issuing a weird apology video explaining that he's been fired from his job and <laughs> being interviewed by the washington square <laughs> journal <laughs> The video of him on the phone calling the cops on them because they're at a barbecue. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. Oh, but there is one brief glimmer of hope for him. After everybody gets done making fun of him, blowing smoke rings in his face and shit, one of the kids is like, hey, man, can I borrow that Bible of yours for a minute? Nothing, just nothing in particular. I just want to see it. <laughs> yeah, this is the Christian version of T-Ball, and he's slamming his bat directly into the floor. He's like, I sure am interested in what Jesus had to say. Yeah, whatever. It's just past the part where I can hit you with a stick, but as long as you get up, it's fine. All right, good night. It's <laughs> fucking missionary wet dream, and he's blowing it. He's blowing right, it. Right? <laughs> I've watched enough of these Christian movies that I was getting blue balls from, and I was like, come on, man. Tell him about the love of our Lord and Savior. <laughs> Daddy want. <laughs> All right, so okay, and then we have to double down on the um on him getting being terrible at getting pranked. So this is the scene where they've like put fruits on his chest as he sleeps, so a possum will come and start eating him and freak and uh, freak the fuck out. My favorite character in the movie, Fat Possum. Fat Possum's pretty awesome. So first of all, this is very clearly a pet possum. And what's supposed to happen in the scene is he realizes the possum's there and goes like, ah, and then the possum runs away. Except this morbidly obese possum is like, dude, there's fucking fruit on your stomach and I'm a pet possum. <laughs> okay, so I assume that they must have like smeared possum pheromones all over him or something because that thing clearly wants to fuck the actor. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> oh, the director was like, okay, and cut. And the possum was like, peanut butter, shut up. Still going. <laughs> <laughs> so Jeremy's like, no, come on, don't climb onto my neck anymore. Peanut butter. All right. All right. Possum. Awesome. <laughs> so, 
Oh my god! And then he freaks the fuck out and he yells to the kids, "I shit you not, go back to the ghetto." No. This is the protagonist of the movie. Oh everybody. Jesus! He screams about how much he hates all of them and he wants them the fuck out of there. So the next morning he starts walking away, which seems weird because he has a motorcycle. But anyway, he's walking off. Ralph, the kid that was interested in the Bible, chases him down and says, hey, man, here's all that stuff we stole from you. I sure am sorry. <laughs> yeah, he's like, hey, so I read the Bible and um, yeah, so I stole some more money on top of the money that I had already stolen from you. I stole some more money, put it into your wallet to give back to you because I read the Bible. And I was like, oh, you know what? That act, that actually tracks. He nailed That's it. Like, yeah, actually, yeah, that is some pretty good reading Brady comprehension. <laughs> Did you build a stone artifice to any other gods? No. Yeah, then you're all good. Right, you're right. totally no good. Places. Yeah. Nailed it. Yeah, and then, but Jeremy's pissed off at him. He's like, man, you can't steal other people's money to give me that. That doesn't count. You have to go give that money back. And he's like, and Ralph is like, hey, man, I didn't steal your motorcycle. You're welcome, asshole. And he throws him the keys. <laughs> <laughs> you are welcome. And, but this, I guess, is a bridge too far for Ralph's friends, right? So he goes to walk back, and the gang confronts him about giving back all that shit. Right. And, of course, Ralph is the one that's afraid of the water, so they drag him out into, like, eight inches of water. <laughs> My favorite little moment here, there's a gang being like, we're a gang, this is serious, you don't do nice things or steal to make up for other stealing. But then one of them's like, ow, 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 the pebbles are hurting my bare feet. Yes. Ow, ow, yes. Ow. <laughs> We're going to teach you a hot, hot sand, hot, hot sand, hot sand. <laughs> <laughs> Does anybody have any of those like aqua socks? We, I want to do it again. All right. So meanwhile, Jeremy goes to see Trisha at the infirmary. And he's he's pretending to be sick, and she's really literally writing like totally full of shit on the medical forms. <laughs> so <laughs> she's like, "How are things going with those kids?" And he's like, "They're rolling joints with the Bible pages." And and she's like, "Why?" And I'm, he's like, "Because Noah didn't like him enough yet. Apparently, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so weird." Yeah, and she's like, "Okay, I'll tell you what. You go tell those kids that Jesus loves them, and we can go." horseback riding and he's like yes got it awesome <laughs> yeah yeah her advice is go yell jesus at him that should fix everything yeah he he says very specifically these kids are worse than libyan terrorists yes he that does was his description yeah but that was aggressive <laughs> <laughs> you know what libyan terrorists need more than anything jesus that's the problem <laughs> you sound like mike pompeo Better go, yeah. <laughs> better go minister to those kids. <laughs> all right. So, yeah, he goes to try to connect with the kids one more time. They're all out playing basketball because of the blackness. <laughs> okay. They're not. They, they're at a basketball hoop. They do have a basketball of baskets, <laughs> but they're running drills. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> which is insane. Like, that's how these these movie makers were like, what do you? What is basketball playing? It's just the weave, right? It's a five-man weave, I think. <laughs> yeah. And I love his effort, by the way, to proselytize at this point. He walks into the middle of their basketball drill, grabs the ball from them, won't give it back, and says, God loves you until they take it back from him. <laughs> That's it. That was That's his it. whole plan. Surprisingly, that doesn't work. <laughs> nope. So then we go to the fire starting competition, right? They've got a competition going like which whichever cabin can start a fire that's big enough to burn the string fastest wins. And the kids cheat and use matches and gasoline. Well, the matches you're allowed you were allowed to use, yeah, but they use gasoline to, to burn. And look, I'm 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 sure Heath would agree that wasn't in the fucking rules. Be more specific about the rules. These kids fucking won. Yeah. There was nothing in the rules that said you couldn't siphon gasoline out of the tractor. The tractor was available to everyone, right? Yeah, I saw nothing about that. Yeah. Also, maybe, or just, you know, hold up the match to the string. I don't that know. would work too, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they may have had a rule on that one, but... So, yeah, so we have that little scene. I guess that's supposed to be humor. And then we get another scene where... Jeremy tries to flirt with Trisha and she pretends to not know what any of the words mean. Oh, yeah. He told the kids about Jesus, so he's supposed to get his date. And she's like, yep, we can go horseback riding, me and all of my friends. And he's like, oh, <laughs> I thought it would just be me. And she's like, I don't know why I didn't say that. 
<laughs> and it's like, oh, I hate all of them. I can't pee on you while they're watching. <laughs> <laughs> He even says, like, he's like, well, I was hoping that you and I could get closer. And, and she's like, what do you mean by cl closer? What, I don't understand the concept of closeness. He's like, you do, though. I'm sure you know about proximity. Stop making me say the things I'm implying. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So the two of them, but he, I guess he eventually convinces her to go out on this boat with him. Right. So the two of them are like rowing out into the lake. And uh, she's like, well, how are things going with the kids? He's like, yeah, not great. Uh, one of them started reading the Bible and, uh, oh boy, mm. man, that'll fuck you right up. Did you know God murdered a bunch of people? <laughs> like a bunch. This is going to sound crazy because obviously you both read the Bible. Great book. It's actually kind of hard to explain how much God loves someone to a child who's grown up around abuse and violence mm. and, and poverty. Yeah. Especially when he starts reading our book and. Finds out that our God murdered more people than he didn't in it. <laughs> yeah. And just to be clear, my uh, my sister got killed by God. Yep. Too. Yep. Still bummed. And Trisha's answer is, but still. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yep. That's it. That's it. That's Cut. the fucking theological ceiling. End of scene. <laughs> so, yeah. So now he, he's going to go have a heart to heart with uh, the aspiring Christian kid who is carving Jesus holding him and his brother. I thought he was carving boobs. It really looked like he was carving boobs. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, he says, uh, you know, I, so I started reading the Bible and you can see Jeremy kind of wince. Right. He's like, <laughs> Ooh, I didn't even highlight the Ooh. only parts you can read without realizing how <sighs> fucked up it is. So here's the thing you got to know about an Amalekite. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, uh, where do I begin? Okay, you know, is does not equal ought. This is so. Stop reading the book. <laughs> I'll tell you what it says. So, and, and and Ralph, that that curious Christian kid or the the Christian curious kid, says, "Hey, man, do you want to pray with me?" And he's like, "Yeah, sure, why not?" But just then, all the other kids show up, so he has to pretend to be an atheist some more. Yep. And apparently they all show up because Grady just caught them all sniffing glue. <laughs> oh. And Jeremy's like, where, at the craft shop? Got it. Sniffing glue at the craft shop. Yeah. Really you know what? I'm going to head over. I'm going to head over to the sure craft shop and make sure that, that glue. That cabinet is I'll all take all the glue. You know what? I'll up. take it. I'll keep it with me. <laughs> Hand me the keys. I'll make sure to relock it. <laughs> Probably still open. All right, so now we cut to another one of these dumbass play things, and this is the one where, like, they get a a page. I guess one of these kids has had a pager this whole time. One of them has a pager. He's got a <laughs> gang-based pager, which means at some point all the gangs in Chicago got together and they were like, all right, everyone, I know it can be a little hard to keep track of who is feuding with who, who is murdering everyone, so here is your geolocated free pager. Everyone take one, and I will page you if there's new gang-related <laughs> violence to inform you about. What, what, it, what I find so hilarious about this, Eli, is that, like, yes, obviously in 1991, these kids would have a fucking pager. Um, you just weren't yeah. there for the pager part of it. It was like a four-year window where everyone had a pager, but this was in it, yeah. Oh. But so, yeah, so they get a page from one of the, the gang kids in Chicago. So they go and dump what would be like eleven and a half dollars into a payphone, right, <laughs> to call them and find out what's going on. And, and it turns out that uh, there are the opening salvos of a gang war back home, right? Mm -hmm. So but they have this conversation about, like, you know, should they retaliate when they get back? Should they escalate the gang war? Should they let it die down? And aspiring Christian kid is not so sure he wants to provoke a, a, a gang war when he goes home. Yeah. yeah. There's some wisdom in the Bible about that. He's like, yeah, I was reading the Bible. Uh, the whole race wars and murder thing, it's pretty much the whole book, but it does work out badly for a lot of people. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't yeah. go well, let me tell you. <laughs> to which gang leader produces an enormous knife for him again. Yep. Where, it's, it's huge. These kids must have the rectal elasticity of Andy Dick that they're just constantly <laughs> hiring. <laughs> These things. And by the way, Jeremy sees this and walks over to a spying Christian kid and he's like, hey, do you want to talk about it? Can't help but notice he just handed you a giant hunting knife and ran his thumb along his throat. No? Okay, cool. Well, we'll talk about it. Do you want to, uh, 
You want to carve a false idol with it? You Maybe whittle a little bit? You, do you need a white savior? Some or, uh... Bible characters? You're going to get in trouble for that. <laughs> all right. Well, I'll tell you what. This movie is threatening to have something interesting happen. So I think we all need a minute to let that calm down. But first, let me give Act 3 the hard sell. Will Ralph ever learn to swim? Will it be in the blood of his enemies? Find out the answers to these questions and more when we return for the The Credits Are Rolling Now So It Must Be Over conclusion of Geronimo. Okay, so now you put the ramen in the bowl, add hot water. No, okay, wait, wait, wait. add spice packet, then add the hot water. Okay. Hey, uh, Keith, what you typing? Hey, uh, yeah, well, you know how everyone's doing cool stuff in the quarantine? Like what? Well, like Noah wrote a book, and Anna had a kid. I mean, I, I also like, had a kid. Oh, yeah? You, you do a lot of the pushing... A lot of the breastfeeding. Fair. You, that's you involved nope. in a lot of that? that yeah. Okay. So I'm finally getting around to my cookbook based on my popular YouTube channel, Cooking Ramen with Heath. I feel like I'll, I'll really be able to, to say I did something during the quarantine, you know? I mean, why don't you just take better care of your teeth with Quip? Really? I feel like I already got you with the pushing joke. No, Heath, Quip. Good health starts with good habits. Quip makes it easy by delivering all the oral care essentials you need to brush and floss better. That's why I use Quip and why our listeners should too. Oh, yeah? Well, what do they send you? They send you the Quip electric toothbrush, which has timed sonic vibrations with 30-second pulses to guide a dentist-recommended two-minute routine. And there's even a size-down version designed for kids. Paired with Quip's anti-cavity toothpaste and mint or watermelon, you get all the ingredients teeth actually need. And none they don't. Delivered, like, right to my door? Yep. Quip brush head, toothpaste, and floss refills are automatically delivered on a dentist-recommended schedule every three months for just $5 each. A friendly reminder when it's time to refresh and stay committed to your oral health. And shipping is free. So I can make better oral hygiene my quarantine goal? That can be my thing? You sure can. And if you go to getquip.com slash awful right now, you get your first refill for free. That's your first refill free at getquip.com slash awful. That's G-E-T-Q-U-I-P dot com slash awful. Quip, the good habits company. Okay, I guess I'm in, but it's too bad, though, because I think a lot of people would have loved this ramen book. Sure. Is it? Is it just these four pages, though, or is it? There like aren't a- that many flavors, okay? There's like a few. That's it. Okay. So you're a new counselor, huh? Yeah. Okay, whatever. But um, just know I've got some pretty dark stuff going on in my life, so I don't care what you think. Oh, what kind of dark stuff? Trust me, it's pretty bad. It's pretty bad stuff. Oh, come on, man. You could tell us. Yeah, my, I mean, my stepfather's physically abusive to the point where I have PTSD. Oh, wow. You do? Yeah. Yeah, And it's going to be revealed that my father literally left me on an island to die as a child. So shit. Wow. Seriously? I mean, look, we're here because we witnessed a murder and our lives are in danger because of that. They are. I mean, more than the usual amount of danger from living in a violence heavy, impoverished area, which, to be clear, is incredibly dangerous. Yeah, just just every day, just. Yeah, so even the water wow. is dangerous. So what's your story? Oh, um my um my sister died. Oh uh, man, that's mm-hmm. the wor- murder, right? She got murdered? Oh, like chopped wh- up? No. No, the just a car crash. Oh. What's well, um Yeah, it was unfortunate. It is un- it's not just that though. It's not no. I have but the, Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. what no. what else? Uh also, also her friend, my sister, my dead sister, has a friend who will not fuck me. Ooh. Yeah, that that's bad. That's bad. Mm. Right? Yeah. So, you know, just watch out. Mm. Sure. Mean. Will do. Yep. It will be politically divisive to say that my life matters in 20 years. Mm-hmm. We're talking about me right now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> And we're back for still more of this shit. We're going to open up on Jeremy almost catching Grady beaten off to a Sports Illustrated. 
again, what <laughs> was cut from this movie that this stage? <laughs> Grady as a character has done nothing except introduce information, and now it would. I, it's like if in one episode of Shining Time Station, Schemer was just yanking it to child porn when they walked in, and they were just like, "Whoa, Schemer!" And he was like, "Here's a nickel, go away." <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's not besmirch masturbating to the Sports Illustrated swimsuit issue as a thing. That's what a lot. <laughs> this was. First of, of all, this was that. not the swimsuit issue. Um, no, it was just this, Sports Illustrated. But still, and no shame in that either. But what the fuck was it doing in this Christian movie? <laughs> that's cl- that's a classic 1990 thing for people to do. <laughs> oh, like I the remember. Wonder Years theme song started playing in my head and I got all nostalgic. Like that would be my... <laughs> oh, man. Gosh. I wish I could just go back and show little baby Eli who just had those Sports Illustrated issues, how much porn there is now. Yeah, he'd, right. He'd die. He'd die. <laughs> give, give him something to look forward to. It would have made the depression a little er, easier to handle young, uh, in the younger <laughs> days. All right, so so now Jeremy goes, so he, I guess, got um, the comic relief guy from way back when in the Fisher hat. That guy is supposed to go watch his kids for the night so that he can go have a surprise date with Trisha that she is unaware of and has not consented to. Yeah, I'm pretty sure a surprise date is just called assault these days. But back in the Christian movie of the 1990s, it was a surprise date. Jesus. Holy fuck was this uncomfortable. He shows up. He hands her flowers. She's clearly not interested. He starts rubbing her shoulders. She tells him she's not interested. And he says, are you sure? Because your eyes seem to be giving me a different message entirely. Uh, Yeah. He says, you're a tease. And I wrote, you know what? This character was unlikable and racist, but he wasn't rapey. And now this movie has fixed that. Yeah. Yeah. Jesus. But we discover what her real problem with him is, right? It's not that she's just not interested. It's that he's been reading philosophy books instead of the Bible. (laughs) You (laughs) son of a bitch. You changed to philosophy instead of the Bible. Also, you're sexually assaulting me. But mostly it's the philosophy thing. Like fucking Christianity, I guess, is book monogamy. I don't know. (laughs) She says... You're using philosophy as a crutch. And he's like, you use the Bible as a crutch. And she's like, yeah, the Bible's a great crutch because it always works. <laughs> Should we pause the movie and, you know, think about what we just said for a second? <laughs> no. So, yeah, but she could not be clearer about the fact that she has no romantic interest in him. Because and just of what, the philosophy thing? Like, well, Yeah. <laughs> like classic Romeo and Juliet story. It's the ancient Israeli theist and German nihilist. They just can't get along. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so she sends him back to the cabin. He gets there and all the kids just got back from the front lines of Verdun, apparently, right? He <laughs> steps in and all the kids are in the middle of like PTSD flashbacks and shit. Yep. <laughs> the, the little kid is like, rolling back and forth on his bunk screaming (laughs) and he's like he wakes him up and he's like oh it's just dream about my stepdad and he's like does he hurt you and i wanted the kid to be like no no i scream his name in my sleep because of how awesome he is i was dreaming about (laughs) our our last water fight it's awesome (laughs) (laughs) which jeremy replies to by being like oh you you want to call the cops because They'll, they'll come and, and kill you for holding a TV remote. And then your stepdad yeah. can't hit you anymore, huh? That's right, like, right. No, oh, yeah, no, they'll they'll punish him for like three or four weeks and then send him back to you. Yeah, right. No, and, and so, you know, he realizes this. But then we have the moment where, like, he realizes that Nietzsche can never do for him what Jesus does. So he, like, <laughs> walks out onto the porch of his cabin and throws out his philosophy book like an <laughs> alcoholic pouring that last glass down the drain. <laughs> I really wanted a kid at the camp to just pick up that book of philosophy and be like, oh, okay, cool. He's dead, huh? No, 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 no. I was just, I was doing a dramatic throwaway thing. That is not no. <laughs> Don't, don't read that. Don't stop. He's he's alive. He's God's not dead. He was never. Oh, he's gone. He's gone. <laughs> and also, so he throws that out, and uh, he's like, "Gee, I just don't know what I'm gonna do with myself. I just learned that one of these kids I'm 
taken care of, has an abusive dad, and I've already gotten over that and gone back to my problems of Trish not wanting to fuck me. <laughs> and then Fishing Hat Kid, yeah, who is sitting outside, is like, oh, I'm I'm actually also physically abused, but um, let me know if I can help you out with that Trish thing. <laughs> Um, I was just waiting on this bench in case something like this happened to somebody else. Cool. cool. <laughs> yeah, like this entire movie is just people with bigger problems than him helping him with his problems. Yep. All right. So now we cut to the next day. He's getting in trouble. Did anyone catch what he was getting in trouble for? Yeah, I, I guess the kids were like destroyed the bunk when he left them with fishing hat guy. But the counselor, like the head of the camp is very clear. He's like, yeah, you know, those kids, uh, they destroyed their bunk and you were in charge of watching them. This is entirely your fault because they're here as a substitute for a prison sentence. But uh, we're going to punish them instead of you because, you know, smart, smart. Yes. Okay. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, they, they like whittled the bomb. That's not really <laughs> me. I don't know. It's just like a weird. OK, they can, they can produce weapons out of their anuses in an <laughs> astonishing rate but, but then the counselor adds he's like yeah so i'm not gonna send the kids to jail i'm just gonna you know ask you to make sure they're away from us from now on that'd be great can you yeah. just get them out of our white area <laughs> yeah Right. Well, he says at one point, like, like he's like, you know, I want to punish you and I want to punish these kids, but you've reached these kids in a way that no one else could. And I'm like, what are you even talking about? Right. Wait, like, are you the only one that can refrain from screaming racial epithets at them when they walk by? <laughs> Except when you did those few times. But like, most yeah, right, not. right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> most of the time. Uh, I see here on our tally sheet, you've only used the word Octoroon three times this summer. So, yes, oh. you're, you're their dad now. Good job. Everybody gets eight. <laughs> and what's great is this counselor keeps going back and forth. He's like, I should fire you. But I won't. I should kick those kids out of camp. But I won't. And I will the, do that. I wanted the kid to leave and for him to just be like, good job not doing anything today, Steve. Good job. <laughs> yeah. A lot of stuff you should have done that you didn't. Well done. <laughs> so, yeah, but the eventual resolution is that, it, that everybody can stay, but they have to get the black people the hell away from the white people. So they have to go out in the woods and actually go camping, camping for a couple of days. Right. And so Jeremy goes out and tells the kids, hey, you know, we'll, we won't get in trouble if we all go camping. And one kid says, hey, that's great, guys, because I just bought this enormous bag of weed somehow. <laughs> and we'll all be able to smoke it. The one kid pulls out this like four and a half ounces of weed. And he's like, no, this is actually going to work out well for us. <laughs> oh, I mean, to be fair. It's 1990s weed, which is slightly stronger than 1970s weed, but it's going to take a while for them to get through all that weed and actually feel it. All right. As the one of us who is smoking weed in the 1990s, I can say that's no, no, it's <laughs> I don't believe that. Yeah. So, OK, so they go out to camp and <sighs> fucking this is the part where like uh, Jeremy tries to take Ralph's switchblade away and then fights the children. <laughs> it's yeah. so Okay, throughout this movie, Jeremy has been walking up to armed gang members and being like, give me the switchblade, give me the chain, give me the nunchuck. This is the one time at which these children were like, actually, I have a weapon. No. no. Yeah. No. <laughs> right. We, we actually brought you out here to possibly murder you, so <laughs> not going to hand you the knife. Well, there's this amazing moment where he seems to realize that, right? He's like, all right, now it's just the five of you kids who have been trying to murder me since the moment we met and uh, switchblade. <laughs> you know what? Okay, I'm getting it now. <laughs> I, see what, yeah, I see what you guys did. All right. Did you guys bring my drugs by any chance? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Oh, and then, of course, he's like, he decides the best thing to do to, like, convince the kid with the switchblade to give it to him is to fight that kid. Right, so he, he physically assaults the kid. The kids whip his ass instantly. So I I had to stop the movie. I was laughing so hard because he <laughs> instantly loses this fight to these kids. Because yes. you think maybe he's gonna like have this confrontation and prove himself to these kids. No, they give him an atomic wedgie and he shits himself <laughs> within a quarter of a second. <laughs> yep, they hold a knife to his throat and they're like, "You're alive because we're nice." That's it. 
That's the only reason. And they're like, oh, okay. So, and and that's it, by the way. That's the end of that scene. We cut to that night and, and Jeremy trying another heart-to-heart with Ralph, right? Which, again, means they held the knife to his throat and they were like, be aware that we could have murdered you. And he was like, okay, let's continue over Got to it. Indian Rock. We have a thing to do. <laughs> so I'm not going to lie. My heart's not really in this swimming-based trip anymore, but my word is my bond. Let's go. <laughs> and then he goes over to Ralph and he's like, hey, buddy, thanks for not killing me, I guess. What you thinking about? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yeah, so it's time for Ralph to tell us this deep, dark backstory of why he's afraid to to swim. It turns out when he was a kid, his dad took him out on a little boat, dropped him on an island, and then left to go get some cigarettes. It's a pretty sad fucking story, right? <laughs> the kid was left on an island to die, tried to swim back, didn't quite make it, was rescued by a stranger, and then became a ward of the state. Yeah, and Jeremy tries to twist this as to his thing with his sister. He's like, yeah... Yeah, my sister died in an unfortunate accident. Tie. So. <laughs> that's a tie. I get it. We both had things happen that weren't you stabbing enjoyable. Me again? You're stabbing me. Okay, that's fair. Okay. You know what? You know that's what? Fair. To be fair, I've earned that. <laughs> <laughs> and there also is this great moment where George or whatever the kid's name is, is like, yeah, man, I mean. Where was God when my father abandoned me on an island to die? And he's like, oh, um, he was there. He was just sort of. He was yeah. uh, he's in traffic. Probably no. was in traffic. Uh, I mean, headed. Honestly, absentee drunk dad. That's God. If we're being honest. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Jesus went out to get cigarettes 2000 years ago. <laughs> and he did say he would be right back. Where the fuck is he? Boy, didn't he? <laughs> So, yeah. And so he's like, hey, man, God was right there with you the whole time that you were almost drowning and terrified as a child and, and, and you know, had no hope. And he's like, man, come on. This is the same guy that killed your sister that you're talking about. He's like, right. Um, um, maybe I hated my sister and he killed her for me. <laughs> um, <laughs> so. Okay, that I know. I was just trying to make something up. Let's pray for the problem of evil to go away. Let's see. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. They, so they pray together. Ralph prays for a better life. Jeremy asks Jesus to forgive him for being such a whiny little bitch this whole movie. And then I guess Ralph doesn't have to be scared anymore, right? The Christianity <laughs> has solved his psychological trauma for him now. But you can see, you can see the two actors being like, so. Those are the last lines in the scene, which means hmm. they worked. And Ralph is like, oh, um, weird. OK. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So the next morning now we should point out that like several times in this movie, people have referenced how jumping off of Indian rock is a true test of your bravery and it's super scary and whatever. So that's where we're going to open up the next scene. It's the following morning. And they're on Indian Rock, and Ralph, who has been terrified to go in the water up to this point, is ready to dive in, which is not a very good idea if you don't know how to fucking swim. No, start low. You don't start with the jumping off of the giant goddamn rock into the water to find out if you can swim. You know what? I want to be Christian. Why don't you guys maroon me on an island and let's see <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm over one on that, but like, I don't know. Jesus, right? <laughs> so, but the leader kid shows up, the gang leader kid shows up and says, damn it, Ralph, this is obviously representative of a leap of faith and a baptism. It's going to, it's going to fuck the whole thing up. If you do this, the whole gang, it's our title, Geronimo, you yell, Geron Indian rock, well, native American. So, uh, uh, we're keeping it, but <laughs> it's a pretty sweet tie in. Yeah, he gives him the, like, I'm going to need your badge and gun. <laughs> Yes, right, yeah, uh-huh. Also, just so you know, Ralph, your PTO does not roll over, so, like, you can't, you, now that you've given your notice, you can't take any paid time off. That's part of the introductory packet you got from HR. Yeah. At the gang. They tell him if he does his leap of faith into Christianity, he has to have his tattoo burned off. That'll come back. But also, then he jumps into the fucking water with his goddamn shoes on. Yep. No, don't. 
It's, that's, he heard his feet on the pebbles earlier, and he knew he was going to have to walk over some pebbles to get I, back out. I see. I see. All right. That makes sense. That makes sense. Yeah. So then, you know, he swims and he's Christian now or whatever. And then we have a scene of the kids burning off his tattoo. So apparently <laughs> Jeremy was like, oh, is this kind of torture? Just this is customary. Oh, it's customary. OK, well, oh, I guess like, you literally torture him. Burn it up. Can I just tattoo over it? Nope. The gang one? Just have a, a square? <laughs> a square of tattoo ink? No. You guys uh, doing a torture thing? All right, I'll wait outside. But let yeah. me know when the torture is over. I, uh, I've i already done my job. Yep. Exactly. <laughs> He's Christian now. If you kill him now, he gets to go to heaven. All right, so now, so that's it. They're leaving camp now. We learn that the little dude whose dad was abusive is in custody, so that problem solved. Good thing there was a white person there to... Savior him. Yeah. yeah. No, thank you. Uh, nobody ever thought of calling the police on that abusive dad before now. So, yeah. yeah. And then we get Jeremy saying goodbye to the, the gang kids as they're getting back in the, the van from the Department of Corrections one by one. They're walking past him. And he's like, all right. Great job having weapons and bombs. And one of you being a Christian now. Excellent. Excellent. Later, Ralph. Get a skin graft as soon as you can. Because that, that was crazy. They've burned your arm off. And it literally, again, he literally does not get to do his fond goodbye with this kid. Because they're like, hey, you treated us like shit this entire summer, you vicious, vicious racist. And he's like, well, I just want you to know, slam. They literally slammed the yes! car in his face as yes! he's doing the I loved you all along speech. Yes. And by the way, at right before all of this, fucking Grady walks up. And he's like, hey, you know, I was supposed to be the bad guy character and we never really fleshed that out. I'm sorry that we never fleshed that out. Grady does the movie equivalent of the person who signed in your yearbook. Like, even though we weren't close, I always thought we were great friends. I don't fucking year know your name. <laughs> <laughs> Stay in touch. Yeah, have a great summer. All right. <laughs> So now, uh, some for just a second, some different narrator tags in to talk about over policing, right? And, and it turns out, I guess that um, Jeremy is watching a TV show about the plight of inner city juveniles, delinquents, or whatever. And uh, we eventually learn that, but for for at least two solid minutes, we're just watching some other movie with a different narrator, and. He then takes over as narrator. I really wanted yep. to hear like a scuffle in the booth, like oh, one out of one hundred. <laughs> hey, get out of here! I'm telling my summer story. No, let me finish my <laughs> over. Get off me! So while I was being attacked by a second narrator, yeah, <laughs> yeah but so but he watches enough TV to realize that black lives do matter. Also, he's back in church now. He's going to church, and then he goes to go see the kids whose last interaction with him was, you hate us, no I do. Yeah. Well, he starts by saying, you know, I wonder what those kids are doing. Probably all dead. But, uh, <laughs> you know, I'm still praying for them. That just felt easier than doing something, you know, just, I'm praying. That was so weird. He actually says that in the movie. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the end of it. That was yes, like the exactly. end of that scene. End of thought. Like, I'm praying for him, though. I don't know. Maybe they're dead. Praying, though. And then the movie is like, oh, yeah, that felt evil. Okay. Well, what if he goes and visits them once? Yeah, they could spend an afternoon hanging out. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, okay, so that's the thing is that we see, we then see him go into the city to hang out with the kids, and they're all suddenly friends, the kids that slammed the door in his face the last time we saw them interact. Right, so we a big chunk of character arc happened off screen. Apparently, they all like him now. Apparently, there was a pen pal situation where they got close. Who knows? I, I guess, yeah. We have this fucking best friends montage. I do want to say too, by the way, because he brings Trisha with him, and at one point they're all playing football together. Trisha's catch in that football game is the best goddamn sports thing we've seen since the backflip in War Room. Oh, I really wanted uh, Trisha to stiff arm the kid, like, because they're playing tag. I wanted yeah. to just... <laughs> oh. truck him like Marshawn Lynch. <laughs> yeah, there you go. They also do a thing where they, they, like, they're having their friendship montage and they go to Wendy's and Dunkin' Donuts, which I thought was weird placement. But as they were coming out of the Wendy's, I really wanted one of them to be like, Do you see that guy asleep in the drive thru? I hope he's okay. <laughs> <laughs> 
But yeah, so we get that montage. They're all going to Wendy's together. And now the only white powder they need is snowballs for snowball fights. And everyone lived happily ever after, except, you know, whatever, four of those five kids that were shot by the police by the time they reached 27. But they're not they're not Christian. They just like hung out for an afternoon. The end. Yep. That's it. Yeah. So look, is there a moral to this story that isn't a hate crime? Uh, no. <laughs> all souls matter? <laughs> Confusing. Yeah, that's a hate crime. All right. Well, that's going to do it for our review of Geronimo, but that's not going to do it for the episode just yet because we still have more Vuda Deja. So, Eli, tell us what's on deck. Transformed. It is a 2005 Christian anti drug kung fu movie. Oh, wow. All right. Yeah. All right. Boy, I was sure there was going to be transphobia in it. Okay. All right. No, that's better <laughs> than I was expecting. So with that to look forward to, we're going to bring episode 255 to a merciful close. Once again, a huge thanks to all the Patreon donors to help make the show go. If you'd like to count yourself among their ranks, you can make a per episode donation at patreon.com slash godawful and thereby earn early access to an ad-free version of every episode. You can also help a ton by leaving us a five-star review and by sharing the show on all your various social media platforms. If you enjoyed this show, be sure to check out our sibling shows, The Scathing Atheist, Citation Need, and D&D Minus, and The Skeptic Ride, available wherever podcasts live. If you have questions, comments, or cinematic suggestions, you can email godawfulmovies to gmail.com. Um, legal services for this podcast are provided by the law offices of P. Andrew Torres. Tim Robinson handles our social media. Our theme song was written and performed by Ryan Slot. Nick of Evil Giraffes on Mars. All of the music was written and performed by our audio engineer Morgan Clark and was used with permission. Thanks again for giving us a chunk of your life this week. For Heath Enright and Eli Bosdick, I'm no illusions. Promise to work harder and earn another chunk next week. Until then, we'll leave you with the Breakfast Club close. America finally decided to start defunding the white man's burden in 2020. Did it, though. Trisha and Jeremy eventually got married. She remains not that into him. Jeremy voted for Trump in 2016 and keeps yelling this story at his niece when she blocks him <laughs> on Facebook. <laughs> But I totally started recording and then I remembered that we normally count that down. So then I said recording it. And I, I almost said recording in three, two, one, you know, because like it didn't matter at that point. But I still felt like I should keep the facade going anyway. But then the one. guilt got to you. Yeah, <laughs> I didn't want to be. But, well, because Morgan's going to know <laughs> one way or the other. And and so like Morgan's going to be sitting there going like, oh, he's the kind of motherfucker that would just sit there and lie in their goddamn faces. <laughs> So now I need Morgan to know that I'm an honest enough broker that I would tell you guys about it. I need time to heal from this. I, I'm, I'm <laughs> rattled. Well, my air conditioner is off, so go fuck yourself. Heal quick. <laughs> I mean, to be fair, I had no idea what the fuck this is. They all talked at once. Every time they yeah. talked. All of them were That's talking. That's true. But there were also a couple of times where just one yeah, of them talked. Yeah, I know. It's it was and like, it still said that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you well, cheeky bastard but i think a lot of it too though and i think this is true is because the kids got away with saying so much terrible shit that i don't think the director understood so the fucking the chick had to be like i say chick whoever did the because of this skit but whoever did the closed captioning had to sit there and go like all right do i do i write snort cocaine on the closed captioning <laughs> for this christian movie okay um, so that's Jive ass honky. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <sighs> Interstitial one. Who knew that the ramen thing would last this long? I didn't think it would have this kind of legs. I knew. <laughs> it doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> Disagree. The preceding podcast was a production of Puzzle and a Thunderstorm, LLC. Copyright 2020. All rights reserved.